Hello, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on the Indian Child Welfare Act. This is uh, one of a series of webinars that have been put together by California Indian Legal Services. This particular one is called ICWA 101, and it will go over all of the procedural and substantive provisions of ICWA, uh, but we'll do them without an opportunity to really go in depth on any of them. So I would certainly encourage you to review our printed materials available on our website um, and also the other webinars that are available through our website or through YouTube. My name is Delia Parr. I'm the directing attorney of California Indian Legal Services Office in Eureka and very happy to be able to get this information out to you. So the goals of the training today are we're going to provide you with a very brief overview of pre-ICWA history to sort of frame the issue. And then we're going to do an overview of ICWA generally, and then discuss how to use ICWA to protect children and families. And we're going to do all of that in under an hour. So we better get going here. The Indian Child Welfare Act was passed after congressional hearings revealed pattern of wholesale public and private removal of Indian children. And here in California, Indian children were eight times more likely to end up in adoptive placement than non-Indian children. And over 90% of those children were placed in non-Indian homes. That is devastating to those children, their families, and certainly their tribal community at large. Congressional findings as a part of the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 were that there was no resource more vital to the continued existence and integrity of Indian tribes than their children, and that the United States government has a responsibility to protect Indian children who are members or eligible for membership in an Indian tribe. Congressional findings also included that an alarmingly high percentage of Indian families were being broken up by often unwarranted removal of children, that children were being removed as a result of a misunderstanding of cultural norms and practices, and that an alarmingly high percentage of such children were being placed in non-Indian foster and adoptive homes and institutions where they frequently suffered serious adjustment problems during adolescence, during this time where, uh, you know, adolescents start to try to de really develop their self-identity. Congress also found that state courts failed to recognize the essential tribal relations of Indian people and that there was uh, no application of cultural and social standards that prevailed in Indian communities and families. And this had a great effect on Indian children, as you can imagine, that Indian adults placed with or adopted by non-Indians identified the following factors as major contributors to the development of the split feathers syndrome. And I would encourage you to Google the split feathers syndrome. There is a um, wonderful article available that's pretty easy to find on the internet. Uh, but some of those um, identified factors include a loss of Indian identity, a loss of family, culture, heritage, language, spiritual beliefs, tribal affiliation, tribal ceremonial experiences, that they experience growing up different than other children would, um, that they face discrimination, that their learning styles were different and not being accommodated in any way. We're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the constitutionality of ICWA because it's really important to understand that ICWA is constitutional because it is not based on race. It is based on membership in a sovereign tribe. Tribes are sovereign entities that have a unique political relationship with the United States government. And it has to do with the fact that Congress has a unique obligation towards uh, Indian people and tribes called a trust responsibility. So the statute, the Indian Child Welfare Act, is not about race. It's really based on this political relationship between tribes as sovereign entities and the United States government. Okay. So with that, now we are able to get into the meat of ICWA. So here we go. 
So we're going to go through some definitions, we're going to talk about what cases are covered by the ICWA, and then we're going to talk about those minimum federal standards that are listed here. So Indian child is a defined term within the Indian Child Welfare Act, and within the Indian Child Welfare Act, an Indian child is defined as an unmarried minor that is either a member of an Indian tribe or eligible for membership and a biological child of a member. So a couple of things there. One is it is not necessary for the child to be eligible in the same tribe where the parents have membership. And as an example of that, um, a child can have a parent, a biological parent, who is a member of the Hoopa Valley tribe, and the child can be eligible for membership in the Yurok tribe, and that child would be considered an Indian child for purposes of the ICWA. Also importantly, we are not talking about enrollment. The federal statute, um, nor do the state statutes, require enrollment as a prerequisite for membership. Membership is something that is determined exclusively by the tribe, and some tribal members may not have a membership card or proof that they are Indian, and that that's a determination that you have to look to a tribe to make. An Indian parent under ICWA again is any biological parent or parents of an Indian child or any Indian person who has lawfully adopted an Indian child, including adoptions under tribal law and custom. And it does not include an unwed father where paternity has not been acknowledged or established. Big note here is that the person does not have to be Indian. So a parent, an Indian parent under ICWA is a biological parent essentially of an Indian child. So you look to the child first, right? Does the child qualify as an Indian child under the definition of ICWA? If the answer is yes, then the biological parents of that child will both be considered Indian parents. This is true even if one parent is non-Indian, does not qualify for membership, has no relations with the tribe, is not Native American in any way, both biological parents of an Indian child are considered Indian parents under the law and both are entitled to the protections that are provided to Indian parents under the law. An Indian custodian is an Indian person, which is defined under ICWA, who has legal custody of an Indian child under either tribal law or custom or state law, meaning a guardianship or an adoption. It's an Indian person to whom temporary physical care, custody, and control has been transferred by the parent. And once a person is considered an Indian custodian, they have the same rights as an Indian parent under ICWA. So they actually stand in the shoes of the parent. And if a child is removed from an Indian custodian, all of the protections of ICWA then apply to that person as an Indian custodian, just as if they were the actual parent. Note here that an Indian custodian has to be an Indian person, and an Indian person is defined under the Indian Child Welfare Act as being a person who is a member of a tribe that's listed on the federal register, so a tribe that's recognized by the federal government. So this is the definition of Indian tribe that's contained within the Indian Child Welfare Act. And it's essentially any tribe that is considered federally recognized, and there is a listing of those that are contained within the federal register. The point that I want to make here, though, is that if you have a tribe that is not listed on the federal register, that tribe still has the right under California law to participate in the proceedings at the discretion of the juvenile court, that that tribe still has valuable information to be able to provide to the court. Uh, so its participation should be welcomed, uh, but it won't technically trigger application of the ICWA to that case. Tribal membership. So tribal membership is a determination that is left exclusively to the determination of the tribe. And once the tribe has made that determination, it is conclusive that the BIA or a county social worker or even a state court judge does not get to come in and review that membership determination. 
that that again is left exclusively to the tribe. Okay, so what cases does the Indian Child Welfare Act apply to? The Indian Child Welfare Act applies in certain child custody proceedings. It applies to voluntary and involuntary proceedings that may result in Indian child's adoptive placement. It applies uh, with regard to any action removing a child from the parent or Indian custodian, remember the Indian custodian actually stands in the shoes of the parent, for temporary placement in foster care, institution, guardianship, or conservatorship or where a parent or Indian custodian cannot have the child returned upon demand and where parental rights have not been terminated. So it's going to apply any time that county social worker comes and removes a child and initiates a foster care proceeding. It is going to apply in probate guardianships in California. It is going to apply um, if a parent is voluntarily relinquishing a child, usually an infant, um, for adoption. And it will also apply within the family law context if a judge is awarding custody of the child to somebody who is not one of the two parents. That it does not apply in um, straightforward child custody disputes that arise as a component of a divorce case. But if custody is actually going to go to a non-parent equal will be triggered. So it applies again to the termination of parental rights, pre-adoptive placements, temporary foster placements prior or in lieu of adoptive placement, uh, any kind of adoptive placements, and again in California probate guardianships. Okay, so we've made it now into the requirements of ICWA. It was important for us to go through the definitions because those are critical to um, really being able to apply the law, um, but now we find ourselves with um, inquiry and notice, which are the two procedural requirements provided under the Indian Child Welfare Act. Inquiry is the requirement to determine if a child is or may be an Indian child. So if there's reason to believe the child is Indian, the court, the county welfare department, and probation departments have affirmative and continuing duties to make further inquiry to determine Indian status as soon as practical. And um, there are three reasons to know that are listed there that um, are sort of typical guidance provided to county social workers. There are others as well, but essentially um, what I think it's important to come away from this slide with is that if there's any indication that the child is or may be an Indian child, then the requirements of inquiry and notice are triggered. So um, at that point, additional questions would need to be asked around whether or not the child is or may be an Indian child. And as a result of that, then we get to notice. There are judicial counsel forms that are mandatory in California um, for both inquiry and notice. Um, so those are all ICWA forms that can be found on the judicial counsel website. So these are the basic formal notice requirements. There are, under the new BIA guidelines, some informal requirements and certainly best practices to keep in mind as well. So let's go through the formal requirements and then we'll talk uh, briefly about the informal requirements. Uh, formally, um, all of the parties listed under bullet point one, their parents, legal guardians, Indian custodians, and tribes must be notified of pending petitions. So if you have a case that is actually going to um, land in the court system, either as a family maintenance case where the child was removed, um, you know, at that point it's a court proceeding and formal notice requirements are triggered. And in that case, proof of notice, including copies of the notices sent and any responses received, must be filed with the court. Those cannot just go out in discovery to all parties. Those have to be filed with the court. And the petition must be sent with a copy of the petition by registered or certified mail. So you have to be looking for the green card. So formal notice must be sent to all tribes of which the child may be a member or may be eligible for membership. 
And this holds true even if the child is actually a member of one tribe. If the child is eligible for membership in other tribes, notice actually has to go out to all of those tribes. And then there's a process by which the tribes first have an opportunity to determine which is the most appropriate tribe. And if there's some conflict, then there's guidance provided under state and federal law um, around which tribe a state court should then essentially choose. Um, also important to notice here, the notice has to go to the tribal chairman unless another agent has been designated for service. And another agent would have been designated for service in the Federal Register for ICWA notice. So there's the Federal Register that's published theoretically once a year or so uh, that lists all of the tribes that the federal government recognizes. There is a separate list, again within the Federal Register, um, but this list includes where tribes have opted to be noticed for ICWA purposes. So for some tribes that continues to be the tribal chairman, for others that is an ICWA advocate or a social services director or somebody like that. But notice is supposed to go to the person designated in the Federal Register for ICWA notice purposes. Notice to the BIA, if the identity or location of the parent or Indian custodian or the tribe can't be determined, notice is supposed to go to the BIA under current California law. This is somewhat in flux under the new BIA guidelines, and we're waiting to see what happens with the regulation, so stay tuned for that. Because it's still in flux, I'm going to go ahead and not talk any more about this particular uh, situation. Um, just know that um, if the identity or location of the parent and in custodian of the tribe can't be determined, then notice is supposed to go to the BIA, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs at this point, early June 2016. Before we start talking about tribal jurisdiction, I want to spend just a moment talking about informal notice since it was um, clarified in the February 2015 BIA guidelines that what tribes have been considering best practice for many, many years um, is now actually federal guidance. Um, and that is to notify the tribe as soon as possible um, anytime there is a reason to believe that that particular tribe's child is involved and that that notice does not need to be the formal notice by certified or registered mail that that can be and should be actually by picking up the phone and calling the tribe sending an email to the tribe somehow making sure that the tribe is aware that a county agency is having an interaction with that tribal family and the reason for that is the tribe and the county or state have concurrent jurisdiction at that phase of the case. Um, and more and more tribes are being very active in the pre-removal sort of emergency investigation component of cases and may actually have been involved with the family for a very long time before the family ever came to the attention of the county. Uh, so it's important that the two entities, the tribal entity and the county entity, really work together at the front end of these cases, that that is the best interest of the child. And again, that's guidance that um, was provided in the February 2015 BIA guidelines, but which many, many counties in California um, have been very good about doing for a number of years already. Okay, tribal jurisdiction. So in California, we have something called Public Law 280. What Public Law 280 does is it provides concurrent jurisdiction over cases involving child welfare until either the state court or a tribal court exercise valid initial jurisdiction. Once a tribal court has exercised jurisdiction over a case, at that point, the tribe has exclusive jurisdiction. Up until that point, again, it's concurrent. It has to be a working together of the county and the tribe. There are some states that are not PL280 states, um, where if a child is located or domiciled on a reservation, that that tribe has exclusive jurisdiction. That is not true in California, so in the interest of trying not to create confusion, um, in California, if a child is domiciled 
on a reservation or off reservation. Um, it doesn't so much matter in terms of jurisdiction. It's going to be concurrent up until the moment that either a tribal court or a state court has exercised valid initial jurisdiction, meaning that one of those two courts have um, actually initiated a case involving that particular child. Okay, so we know that if a tribal court has exercised valid initial jurisdiction over a case, has been the first court to bring the child into its jurisdiction, that that tribal court has exclusive jurisdiction. But if a state court exercises valid initial jurisdiction, it does not have exclusive jurisdiction. Under a Ninth Circuit court decision, it has what's called transfer jurisdiction meaning that if a tribe wants to transfer that case to tribal court, the state court must transfer that case unless there's good cause not to. So good cause not to transfer includes either parent objecting, which currently operates as a veto in California. If the tribal court declines to take the case, obviously good cause to deny the transfer. If it would be an undue hardship on the parties to transfer the case to tribal court. This particular one though, undue hardship on the parties, actually has a secondary criteria. That's an undue hardship that can't be mitigated by the tribal court. Meaning that it doesn't matter that the tribal court is far away or difficult to get to if parties can appear by phone or utilize some other form of technology to be able to uh, be present at the hearing to, um, you know, to still have due process afforded to them, notice and an opportunity to be heard. That tribal courts, just like state courts, typically allow for parties to appear um, telephonically or, you know, in other sorts of ways or to file by fax or email or, um, documents that they may want a tribal court judge to consider. So that particular exception, the undue hardship on the parties, is not something that I see work ever um, because it's so easy for tribes to be able to mitigate the hardship, potential hardship. In California currently, it's good cause to deny a transfer if the tribe or whatever the party, whoever the party was that asked for the transfer waited too long, that the case is at an advanced stage of the proceeding. The caveat here though is that simply waiting until reunification services are terminated is not considered unreasonable delay. That there is an understanding that it makes sense to have a child remain in the state court system um, for certain reasons up until reunification services have ended. Right, that it perhaps keeps the child closer to the parents to be able to maintain or even establish a bond with mom and dad during the time the reunification services are being offered. And because counties are sometimes in a better position to be able to offer reunification services to a parent because they get the funding to do so. Um, so again, if the case is at an advanced stage in California right now, a court can consider that good cause to deny a transfer request to tribal court unless it's simply, um, you know, that the tribe or another party has waited until reunification services have terminated, uh, that that by itself is not considered unreasonable delay. It's important to note here that the February 2015 BIA guidelines completely do away with the good cause exception um, having to do with added advanced stage at all. Um, we are all waiting to see what the regulations give us. Um, also good cause to deny a transfer would be if a child over the age of 12 objects or if the parents of a child over the, five, over the age of five um, are unavailable and the child has little or no contact with the tribe a state court cannot, though, look at the socioeconomic conditions and perceived adequacy of a tribal court service system or judicial system, that that cannot even be considered by the court. If a transfer is denied by a state court judge, that transfer, um, that, that denial has to be in writing. 
So just two more quick points on tribal jurisdiction. One is that under ICWA, a tribe may reassume exclusive jurisdiction over child custody proceedings. So if, for instance, in California, where um, tribes don't have exclusive jurisdiction over child custody proceedings, with the exception of the Washoe tribe on the um, California-Nevada border, any tribe in California has the right to uh, petition to reassume exclusive jurisdiction. So know that. Um, also, importantly, um, tribal acts, judicial proceedings, judgments, and records are entitled to full faith and credit under ICWA. So if there um, is any sort of tribal council resolution or tribal court order that would affect the case, a state court um, is mandated to provide those full faith and credit under ICWA, meaning that they should be looked at like they were the state court's own. Okay, so this is a list of the minimum federal standards that are required by the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, we have so far gone through notice and inquiry, but we're now going to get to everything else on that list. So proceedings following notice. If after a reasonable time following the sending of a notice, but in no event less than 60 days, no determinative response to the notice has been received, the state court may determine that ICWA does not apply to the case and thus further evidence of the applicability of the act is later received. So what does that mean? That means that the county has sent out notice, um, the tribe has not sent anything back that's determinative, that does not indicate whether the child is or may be a member, 60 days have passed, so the state court can then decide that ICWA doesn't apply. However, if on day 62, even after the state court has decided ICWA doesn't apply, somebody says, oh, this child is a member of X tribe that wasn't noticed, or somebody mentions that grandma on the other side might be Native American, that triggers inquiry again. Because again, inquiry is an affirmative and continuing duty. It never ends. So the whole process starts over again. Inquiry and notice and the whole thing starts over again. If the act does apply, so there's been some determinative response received by the tribe, and the tribe is saying that either this child is a member or is eligible for membership, no hearing shall proceed until at least 10 days after the parties received notice. And if the tribe requests it, or if a parent or Indian custodian requests it, an additional 20 days can be granted in order to allow those parties to prepare for the proceedings. Okay, intervention. So an Indian custodian or a tribe have a right to intervene at any point in the proceeding. They can intervene early, at detention, at jurisdiction, at disposition. They can intervene later. They can intervene at the 2-6 hearing where there's a um, recommendation of a termination of parental rights. A tribe can intervene for the first time on a appeal at any point in the proceeding. A tribe may be represented by counsel, by an attorney, or by another designated representative, which is often a tribal social worker. And intervention can be done orally or in writing. If it's done in writing, it's typically done by tribal resolution, but um, may also be done through a judicial council form. But again, it does not need to be done in writing. It can be done simply uh, orally. And it's really important to understand that even if the tribe does not intervene, which would generally be due to a resource issue, the act, the federal law, those minimum standards that we just looked at that list of still have to be applied to the case. Regardless of whether or not the tribe is there banging on the table, those minimum federal standards have to be applied to the case. Right to information. Each party has the right to examine all reports or other documents filed with the tribe, and the Indian custodian and tribe are parties 
if they've intervened, and have a right to disclosure and discovery. And there was some concern around confidentiality, um, specifically with regard to um, sharing of information before a case had actually been initiated within the court system. Um, so there was an amendment, though, to Welfare and Institutions Code 827 that has clarified that information can be shared with the tribes even early on before a court case has been initiated. So hopefully as a result of that, um, there will be more coordination and collaboration throughout the case. ICWA requires that active efforts be provided to prevent the breakup of the Indian family, meaning that active efforts have to be provided before the child is removed, which begs the question, what are active efforts? Well, active efforts are determined on a case-by-case -case basis, and they're efforts that should take into account the prevailing social and cultural conditions of the tribe, and that they are intended to be culturally appropriate and not tainted by cultural bias. So this would include offering services like positive Indian parenting or referring an individual to a culturally appropriate substance abuse treatment program like Friendship House or um, finding a way to offer culturally appropriate counseling that would include a trauma component to address the intergenerational trauma that exists within communities, things of that nature. So again, in order to place a child out of the custody of a parent or Indian custodian, there have to have been active efforts to prevent the breakup of the Indian family and there has to be a showing that those efforts were unsuccessful. And that has to be shown by clear and convincing evidence. Active efforts must include attempts to utilize available resources of extended family, the tribe, social services agencies, and Indian caregivers. So again, this goes back to the need to be working with the tribe uh, prior to removal. Um, and how do you find those services? Well, you ask. You ask the tribe and tribal social services and Indian health, and you get in contact with extended family. Um, these are all best practices. So here are four concrete suggestions around active efforts that have been requested over time. Um, so they're collaborate with the tribe on the development of the case plan, document all the active efforts, provide regular status updates to the tribe, whether that's formal discovery or not, and request input from the tribe at every juncture. A state cannot rely on the argument that it lacks the resources to provide active efforts in order to refuse the mandate to provide these efforts. So if the family needs a particular service, the a county cannot just say, well, we don't have that service. Active efforts are required by federal law. There are no exceptions in ICWA to the mandate that active efforts be provided. And the best way to meet the needs of the child and the family and to avoid unnecessary conflicts is to seriously consider whether one has met the active efforts requirement as opposed to reasonable efforts. A quote taken from the Native American Rights Fund. Um, they publish a guide called A Practical Guide to the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is available on their website. Moving along to placement preferences. The Indian Child Welfare Act provides two separate sets of placement preferences, one with regard to foster care placements and the other with regard to pre-adoptive placements. When we're talking about foster care placements, um, the placement shall be the least restrictive setting which approximates a family situation and shall be within reasonable proximity to a child's home. So that's the first part and within the following order of preference a member of the extended family, a foster home approved by the tribe, an Indian foster home, or an institution approved by tribe or operated by an Indian organization. And keep in mind that uh, for purposes of this preference order and um, the entire Indian Child Welfare Act, that Indian is defined within that law to mean a member of a federally recognized tribe. An Indian child may be placed in a non-Indian placement only if the court finds that a diligent search has failed to locate a suitable Indian home. And under SB 678, which is the law that codified ICWA into California code, 
the agency must make active efforts to place the child in a home that will commit to allowing visitation with extended family and participation in cultural events of the tribe. A judicial good cause finding is required to deviate from ICWA's placement preferences. And I should tell you now that the February 2015 BIA guidelines uh, provide guidance on this particular issue that is in conflict with existing California law. So this again is one of those areas where we're waiting to see what the regulations say um, and you know, then we'll have to figure out how to make sure that state and federal law align with each other. So this is based on current California law, which says that is good cause is required to deviate from the placement preferences and that good cause could include a parent and or child's wishes. It could mean the extraordinary physical or emotional needs of the child, keeping in mind that the extraordinary physical or emotional needs of the child would need to be demonstrated by a testimony of a qualified expert witness. It could also simply be the unavailability of a preferred placement. Although, uh, in my personal opinion, because a tribe can approve a non-Indian home within the placement preferences, um, assuming that the department was able to locate a non-Indian home that was willing to keep the child connected to the tribe and provide those extended visits, all of those things, that you may not actually need a good cause finding there. It would really determine, be determined um, based on whether or not the county and the tribe were able to adequately work together to find the best possible fit given available placements. The burden of proving good cause is on the party seeking to modify the preferences. So if, the good, if there's going to be a deviation from the placement preferences for any reason, uh, the party who's seeking to deviate from the placement preferences has the burden of proving good cause. That's usually the county. The tribe may establish a different order of preference by resolution, and we certainly are seeing some tribes do that. Uh, many tribes after the adoptive couple versus baby girl case that got so much media um, at the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of years ago um, started changing the preference order to include a biological dad as number one and then would keep the list going down. Um, but other tribes change it based on tribal standards, which is entirely appropriate and allowed under federal law. Placement is absolutely a continuing problem. Um, according to this all-county letter, the California Indian population now exceeds that of any other state, including Alaska, and that data indicates that over 50% of Indian children are placed with non-relative, non-Indian substitute caregivers. This reflects placement determination made notwithstanding expressed congressional preference in the ICWA on placement of Indian children in Indian homes. Two key points to take away here. One is that the department has the duty to make active efforts to locate a placement that it is ICWA compliant. Second is that active efforts should also be used to maintain tribal placements. One of the problems that so many tribes have contacted us about is that the tribe will locate a placement, child will be placed there, and that placement will fall apart that that placement will ask for respite, which will not be provided. That placement will um, ask for assistance in transporting the child to the myriad of um, visits that the child has to go to, or the counseling appointments, or the doctor's appointments. Um, children in the foster care system have to be transported a lot. And it has been our position for a good long time that um, Given the fact that active efforts have to be made to locate an ICWA compliant placement, it reasonably follows that active efforts should also be used to maintain tribal placements. Transitioning now to talk about permanency planning for Indian children. Um, there is an exception to termination of parental rights that has been built into California law. 
So in the best interest of the child, a court may find a compelling reason not to terminate parental rights. And compelling reasons include that there would be a substantial interference with the child's connection to the tribal community, which would be caused by a termination of parental rights, or that the child's tribe has identified guardianship or long-term foster care with a fit relative. So uh, with regard to the substantial interference with the child's connection to the tribal community um, that would be caused by the termination of parental rights, one of the arguments that we make uh, there quite regularly is that under the uh, federal law regarding probate for Indian trust land, for land that's held in trust by the federal government for individual Indian persons, um, that law is called the American Indian Probate Reform Act. And um, if there's a termination of parental rights, that that child will no longer be able to inherit from the biological parents. So that would then sever that child's connection with that land. And that would interfere with the child's connection to the tribal community. Also in California, we have tribal customary adoption, which became effective on July 1st of 2010. This is a law that allows for the adoption of Indian children within the laws, customs, and traditions of a tribe without terminating parental rights. So the basic idea here is that there's a new permanency option that's consistent, or at least more consistent, with tribal beliefs and values, and that does not require a termination of parental rights. And this is um, unique just to Indian children and is only available uh, within the juvenile dependency context. It is not available in family law, for instance, or probate guardianship or any of those other venues. So some key points here um, are it's only available when the tribe agrees. A tribal customary adoption cannot be done without the tribe. That again, it's only available in dependency cases. And it's only available for children from federally recognized tribes. And it requires the collaboration with tribes throughout the process. Um, that there is a requirement in California law that reports as early as disposition are required to include the tribe's position on tribal customary adoption as a concurrent plan. And I'll just mention here that uh, there is another webinar specific to tribal customary adoption, so we are not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but if you have questions on this topic, do take a look at the other webinar. Placement preferences. So uh, as we discussed earlier, um, there are two separate sets of placement preferences. Um, we have gone over the foster care placement preferences. Note that the adoptive placement preferences look different. That it still starts with a member of extended family, but then instead of going to a foster home approved by the tribe, we then look to other members of the child's tribe and then other Indian families. Um, again, tribes can modify this and a state court can deviate from these pla placement preferences, but only if there is a judicial finding. So the, the court, not a social worker, but a court would have to consider whether or not there's good cause to deviate. Also keep in mind here that again, Indian is a defined term for purposes of this law, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and here it means a member of a federally recognized tribe. Invalidation. So invalidation is the sort of frontline remedy that the Indian Child Welfare Act contains within itself that says that an Indian child, an Indian parent, an Indian custodian, or a tribe may petition a court to invalidate the proceedings. If there's a showing that sections 1911, 1912, or 1913 were violated. So if um, notice wasn't provided, if active efforts weren't provided, um, if a council wasn't appointed to a parent, unfortunately it does not include placement violations. But if there's a showing that uh, the provisions that are contained in 1911, 1912, 1913 were violated, then um, any of those parties, including a tribe, can petition a court to invalidate the proceedings, to um, require them to go back and do it over again as if they never happened. Okay, so here we are. We have gone over 
the procedural and substantive requirements of the Indian Child Welfare Act. We have done it very, very quickly. And certainly there is a lot more to know about each of those requirements. Um, there are other webinars available through CILS uh, that do go into depth on at least some of those. Um, and there are other materials available on our website and our contact information is also there. Um, we have provided here a list of some of the others with the code section so that um, you can take a look at them if you need to. Uh, but we are trying very hard to keep these presentations at about 45 minutes and we are there now. So um, I really, really hope that this information has been helpful to you in understanding how the Indian Child Welfare Act applies to child custody proceedings. And I encourage you to uh, continue the learning process through the other materials that are available through CILS and other organizations nationally. Feel free to contact us um, if we can be of any assistance.